the Buddha's first sermon, he defined suffering or stress, the word dukkha, as the five clinging aggregates. And he stated that our duty with regard to those five clinging aggregates is to comprehend them. Elsewhere he said, comprehension means getting rid of all passion, aversion, and delusion around them. And so in his second sermon he showed how to do that. He talked about how the five clinging aggregates should be seen as not self, both because they don't lie within your total control. If there's any disease in any of the aggregates, you can't say, go away. Sometimes it goes away, but it doesn't really obey you. The other argument being that the aggregates are inconstant, stressful. And if something is inconstant, stressful, it's not really worthy of taking it as yourself. We look at the analysis of the aggregates, form, feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness, and it can seem strange. But you have to remember that we, coming from the West, tend to look at issues of how we engage with the world, taking the sense of sight as our major paradigm, and the questions that come with your sense of sight, because there's so much that you have to do in order to take the raw data from splotches of color coming into the eye and building them into a three-dimensional world that you can actually move around in. And the question sometimes comes, does that world actually exist? Are there any things out there that really lie behind, say, your visual image of them? That sort of question. And how do you check? But in ancient India, that was not the paradigm. The paradigm was the act of feeding. This is how we engage in the world. As the Buddha said, all beings have one thing in common, which is that they have to have food in order to survive. He was building on an older tradition. You look at the Vedas, and the main concern was how to provide a source of food for yourself, not only in this lifetime, but also in after death. And the Upanishads, in their theories about what the self is and how it fares after death, are basically about mystical knowledge about the nature of reality. And once you have that knowledge, then that becomes your food. So the Buddha was building on an old tradition. What was radical about his contribution was to say that these aggregates are suffering when you cling to them. Now, the word for clinging can also mean to take sustenance. In other words, you feed off of these aggregates. And as it turns out, there's a double level of feeding. Because the best way to understand the aggregates is to see how they relate to the most basic function of a being, which is to feed. Think about feeding on physical food. You've got the body, that's form, and you've got the form and the, the food out there. And the question as to whether it exists or not is not really one. You just stick it in your mouth, and if you get nourishment, that's good enough. But you're driven by a feeling, the feeling of hunger, the pain of hunger, and the desire for the pleasure of feeling full. But that doesn't last. And there's perception, how you label things in the world. And your first act of perception is to figure out what's edible and what's not. Think of a little child crawling across a room. It encounters something, what does it do? The first thing it does, it puts it in his mouth. So our first perceptions revolve around edible, not edible. Tastes good, doesn't taste good. Then fabrication is the big aggregate, because that comes from us a lot. First you have to formulate a desire to want to eat. That's a fabrication. A desire to get rid of the pain of hunger, a desire to recognize what's edible, what's not, to recognize what kind of hunger you've got, and then you look for the food. And when then you find it, oftentimes you have to fix it. 
There's a lot of foods out there that you simply can't eat raw as they are. But you've learned skills in how to put them together, various foods, how to treat them so that you can't eat them. And then there's consciousness, which is aware of all these things. So if you want to understand the aggregates, think about how they relate to feeding. And that way of dividing things up becomes very clear. That seems actually very natural. This applies, of course, not only to feeding outside, but also mental feeding, emotional feeding. You think about the path. You feed off the path of the various factors of the Eightfold Path. Right concentration is the one that's most often compared to food. Here again, you've got form, the breath, feeling, the feeling of dis-ease you might encounter when you're first trying to settle down, and then the feeling of pleasure you're trying to develop. The perceptions that you keep in mind about how the breath goes, where you can focus on the breath, your relationship to the breath. And fabrication starts out especially with directed thought and evaluation. You talk to yourself about how it's going on, and then you make adjustments. That too is fabrication. Until things get just right, you get the feeling you want. Then you continue your work with it. You spread it around. So eventually you're aware of the whole body. The sense of ease courses throughout the body. Your awareness covers the whole body. That's the aggregate of consciousness. So here, too, you've got the act of feeding. Only in this case, this kind of feeding doesn't come under the first noble truth. It comes under the fourth. This is what you do with the aggregates so you can get beyond them. So when you think about the aggregates in this way, you get closer to understanding why the Buddha divided them up the way he did. But even though you find sometimes the different ajans will differ on how the aggregates relate to one another, the important thing is not so much precisely where the lines are drawn, but that you see that these activities cover anything that you might want to identify with. And when you take them apart in this way, you begin to see the Buddha is right. They really are inconstant, stressful, they're not worthy of taking as yourself. You can apply those three perceptions to all kinds of things, but the Buddha specifically recommends in the beginning applying them to things that would pull you off the path. And things that you really like that would pull you off the path. Because after all, there's a lot of liking that goes with clinging. And this is where the teaching on the Four Noble Truths and the Three Characteristics really goes against the grain. Precisely the places where you find joy, precisely the places where you feel that you've got to hold on. Those are the places, and the Buddha says, you've got to watch out. You've got to learn how to peel away the appeal of those things. And eventually, so you can stop feeding on them. You're trying to induce a state of what the Buddha calls nibida, which we translate as disenchantment, but also can be translated simply as distaste. You get to the point where you're tired of feeding on these things. You try to induce that first with the things that would pull you off the path. And then when you've done that work, then you look at the path itself. And you realize that even though you've learned how to make the mind as constant as possible and as easeful as possible, and as much under control as possible, still there's there are the ups and downs of the fact that this too is fabricated. You put up with those ups and downs as long as it's the better alternative to whatever else you might go to. But when you've taken care of the other alternatives, when you've taken care of the other alternatives, then you get inclined to turn and look at this. It wouldn't be good if there was something that was not fabricated. That's the point when you're ready to incline the mind to something that's not fabricated. 
and to stop feeding entirely. This is what I said those who can't awakening, they have no hunger. Food is appealing as long as there's hunger. But when you find something that induces you not to have any sense of hunger at all, that's when you know that you've used the teaching on the aggregates for its purpose. And you can let the whole thing go. The commentaries tend to talk about the aggregates as ultimate truths, as opposed to conventional truths. But the forest tradition seems to be more in line with how the canon approaches the whole topic, with, which is that there are all kinds of conventions, including the Buddha's language, including the Buddha's way of analyzing things. That too is a convention. And as with every convention, every agreement that we have about what means what, you get the most out of it if you use it for its intended purpose, to the purpose of analyzing these things in this way. And so you can develop that sense of distaste. Because from distaste there is dispassion. The passion that fueled the fabrication of these things to begin with. When there's no passion, then the fabrication ceases, and from the cessation of the fabrications is release. When you put down everything, worldly conventions, Buddha conventions, when you've reached that goal, that's when you know that you understand the meaning of these things. The word atta in Pali means both goal and meaning. That's the atta of these dhammas. To so make sure that you use this way of looking at things for its intended purpose. And that way you get the most out of it.